good morning good afternoon good evening to everyone uh, we are starting the panel uh, presidential strand on uh, demand and use of evaluation uh, for achieving sdgs by parliaments and very interesting topic and very interesting panel this morning uh, and uh, let me uh, go to the panelist so we have uh, Honorable Kabir Hashim as the chair, Natalia Nikitenko from Kyrgyzstan, Josephine Watera from Uganda, uh, Director General Romilo Emmanuel from uh, Philippines, Mailwa Ganam Tilakaraja from Sri Lanka, and Natalia Koshaleva as the lead presenter from uh, Russia. Uh, we will go into uh, more details about the panelists uh, later. Honorable Kabir Hashim, the chair, will introduce them. Uh, let me introduce uh, Honorable Kabir Hashim. Uh, he is currently uh, uh, a, a member of parliament in Sri Lanka and co-founder and uh, chair of the Global Parliamentarians Forum for Evaluation. Uh, he uh, was the former minister of highways, higher education and investment promotion for the government of Sri Lanka. Also, he is the recipient of the Global Evaluation Award for Parliamentarians for his contribution towards the evaluation field. So he is our chair today. Uh, I will pass the floor to uh, Honorable Kabir Hashim to uh, uh, chair the uh, panel, and he will also introduce other panelists uh, uh, during the panel. Thank you very much, and Honorable Kabir, over to you. Uh, thank you, Arsela. I'm uh, really happy to be chairing this uh, very important uh, session, session eight of the third API uh, conference and uh, EVALFest 2022. Uh, we are all uh, across different countries in different time zones. So I would say good day to everybody uh, and welcome everybody to this session. This uh, session uh, is a very important topic the demand and use of evaluation for achieving SDGs by parliaments. Um, we have some distinguished people on the panel. I will introduce them when we get on to the talk show uh, individually. But, you know, people from with various experiences, uh, but a combination of rare experiences that is being political and having a background of evaluation, which is a rare thing these days. And therefore, this is going to be uh, very interesting for us in this session. Uh, if you look at uh, the evaluation itself, the end users in the end are uh, parliament or government itself. And there has been a huge shift in the last couple of years uh, on the awareness and the need for evidence-based policy making amongst politicians because of the demand from their constituents because of the demand from people, from the public about accountability uh, and transparency. And also because there's so much of a whole lot of data, which is emotionally charged data, fake news, etc., And the volume of data is so much that politicians realize that you need to uh, be able to find out the data that is relevant and therefore, evidence-based policy making is very important, and to be able to find ways of uh, uh, using tools. So there is a shift that is coming, and this is in a very timely uh, situation that we are discussing uh, this topic about uh, the use of evaluation, the demand for evaluation, the use of evaluation for achieving the SDGs by parliaments. Well, at the launch of the SDGs by the UN, it was said that in order to succeed at that time, in court, I would say, I quote, in order to succeed, the SDGs should not be the exclusive domain of the executive presidency or a ministry-driven exercise. It is important to mobilize parliaments around the SDGs, that unquote. And this was said because parliaments Pay, play a very important and essential role in establishing the condition for SDG plans, policies, and programs, because to for it to succeed, parliaments have the power uh, of legislating laws, of having budgets allocated, and to ensure oversight functions within parliaments. So that shows 
the, the important role that parliament plays in the whole process. So I think uh, we're going to have a very interesting debate. And to start this discussion today, our lead presenter is none other than Natalia Koshelva, who uh, has a very good background in her area of work, who's been with us uh, in the field of evaluation for a long time. And she is also the former president of the International Organization for Cooperation. And she's also the co-chair. She's also been uh, a co-chair of EVAL Partners. And she's uh, had the honor of being the recipient of the EVAL Partners Global Award in 2017. So she comes with a uh, lot of background, very respected. Uh, Natalia also happens to be an independent evaluation consultant with years of experience, being on the field, working in the, in the field. And uh, she's also in a lot of international programs. She's part of the Eurasian Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation. And with that background, I think that uh, she, uh, as our lead presenter, will, I think, break the ice, taking us into a very interesting session. So I would call upon Natalia Koshelva to take the uh, microphone. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot, Kabir. OK, the, it's a great honor for me to present, to talk to you today about the role of parliaments in the evaluation ecosystem. And I think, Randika, could I have the next slide, please? Well, I had the honor of being the witness of how members of parliament around the globe were joining forces to set the Global Evaluation Forum. But I think, and it's, I think it's really great that more and more parliaments are getting involved in this movement for the use of evaluation because parliaments play a really unique role in the evaluation ecosystem. And this role stems from their unique role in the national decision-making systems because parliaments as democratic representative institutions bring together a variety of existing value systems and ideologies. And though these ideologies will also affect and values will also affect how the decisions are made, Parliaments really need some common base for this decision making, and evidence can provide this common base. Hence, the parliaments, even when they don't understand this fully, have an inherited need in this high quality information that would inform their decision making. Next slide, please, Randika. So, really, evaluation has this capacity as a profession that and practice that produces high quality balanced information, it can meet the demand, provide this evidence for decision-making to the parliament. And parliament is one of the key users of this information in the country. First is the source of de demand for evaluation results, which can drive the development of evaluation practice in the country. But also parliament has a unique capacity to set the enabling environment for evaluation by infusing evaluation requirements in the adopted laws and even affecting how the evaluation practiced in the country. Please, the next slide, Randika. And I would like to illustrate this idea with several examples. One is the seminal 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act adopted in USA as part of the War on Poverty Package. And this act legislated the 1 billion of grants for schools and school districts to improve quality of education for poor children. And at that time, the, one of the proponents of this law, Senator Robert Kennedy was concerned that the Senate had little control of how these grants will be implemented and wanted to have an independent evidence on this implementation, not coming from schools, but coming from some independent sources. So in developing the evaluation clause for, the, for this law, he partnered with a well-known evaluator working in the education field, Ralph Tyler, and together they 
came up with the clause that required independent evaluation of all projects. projects. And this created a huge demand for evaluation in the US. And some people believe that actually laid the foundation and was at least was a great stimulus for the development of evaluation as a profession. And 60 something years after that, Randika, next slide, please. Uh, the new law was passed, and this is the 2018 Foundation for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act that actually, again, to some extent, created a revolution in the evaluation practice in the US because now every agency working inside the government has to have an evaluation plan and evaluation officer. And I think an interesting part of this Law is also that it requires not just evaluation of programs and policies, but it requires that every agency has a systemic plan for identifying its strategic priorities and collecting evidence. So it's really, I guess, now you have the government system that has to be based on, on evidence. And this is set by the laws passed by U.S. legislative body. Next slide, please. But these pattern patterns actually are not unique for U USA. The USA was the first country that started using evaluation on a regular and massive basis. But the same patterns can be seen in other countries. For example, in 2005, the parliament of the Krasnoyarsk region in Russia included the evaluation clause into the regional law that set the grants for civil society. And actually, at the first iteration of the law in 2005, the law included the budget to use evaluation and allocated 3% of the program budget to this, which again was the stimulus for development of the evaluation system and profession in the region. And once the parliament realized the importance of evaluation and that it really gives the valid data for further decision making and they understand how the money is spent and can be accountable on this to the public, they kept increasing the amount allocated for the budget under with every iteration of the law. So eventually the total budget for evaluation within the program reached 15%. Next slide, Randika, please. And interestingly, <clears throat> there are also models when the parliaments not just require uh, implementing state agency to carry out evaluations, which kind of gives them some control of what they're doing, but it also sets internal offices that conduct evaluation upon requirement and commissioning from members of parliament, which gives the parliament the power to kind of make decisions and get data on the evaluations and policies they deem appropriate. For example, again, in the state of Idaho, the legislature has the office that's called the Office of Performance and Evaluation that has several evaluations working there, which enables the parliament to commission and implement two, three evaluations of priority policies every year. And these decisions are made by, by joint legislative oversight committee that decides what, what policies and state programs should be evaluated. The similar model exists in Switzerland where while every state agency has its own evaluation function, the parliament has the parliamentary control and administration office that also upon decision of the control committees, commissions evaluations that are used then in parliament. Next slide, please, Randika. So I guess hopefully I was able to illustrate that the parliament, the role of the parliament in the ecosystem Thanks for your attention. And with this, I'll return the floor to honorable members of parliament who can talk about evaluation from their perspective. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, Natalia, uh, that was a very refreshing and a thoughtful presentation to set the stage for all of us. Um, I think uh, you uh, went back to uh, uh, history in where in 1965 the U.S. Uh, Congressman Robert Kennedy first uh, to uh, monitor 
the uh, elementary and secondary education system talked about evaluation and then how it be became uh, kind of institutionalized, how Russia followed up, how countries began, how, how demand, that demand was created because of uh, intervention by politicians, congressmen, parliamentarians. That's why it's important that it is linked. The demand for evaluation is uh, very much driven by government itself, but government has absolutely no uh, capacity in that area of evaluation, and that's the gap we need to fill. So, uh, right, uh, it was a good start for us, and we thank you for that excellent uh, presentation. As the lead presenter today, uh, and we, we should thank Natalia Koshelva. I would like to uh, welcome all our panelists uh, who are with us today, uh, who are going to be uh, uh, leading uh, this panel discussion in the next uh, couple of minutes. And um, I would like to uh, also welcome all the participants who are with us, uh, who are joining into this program today. We thank everyone for being here with us. And uh, I would like to uh, say, to, to introduce this session, we are going to discuss a couple of questions, uh, two questions in particular, uh, on which the panelists will uh, uh, give their opinions, their views, and um, then we will take questions and answers from the participants. You could either send in your uh, questions through the chat device, and if you have uh, sufficient time, there would be opportunity for you to ask a question uh, uh, directly. But uh, uh, try to type in your questions as much as possible, and we will try to take as many questions as possible. Uh, as, as for the time available. So, so, I would like to uh, uh, introduce our panel, Natalia Nikitenko, who uh, is a member of parliament in the parliament of Kyrgyzstan. She's been uh, one of the key members in the Global Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation being a huge uh, strength. She's also chair of the Eurasian Parliament Forum for Evaluation. Uh, she's done a lot of things in her own uh, country, in her own parliament, to be able to establish evaluation in her parliament. She's uh, also supported the, uh, the development and strengthening of evaluation in, uh, uh, the, uh, in uh, the European region. So she's looked at a leader in this area. Uh, we welcome uh, uh, Honorable Natalia Nikitenko. Then we have Dr. Romulo uh, E.M. Miral, who has experience uh, coming from a completely another site. He's the Director General of Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department in the House of uh, Republic uh, in Philippines. He has, I think, over 30 years experience in the field, and he's been a key driver in pushing Philippines towards an eva institutionalizing evaluation. He has hands-on experience, professional experience in public expenditure management, so which uh, uh, kind of merges together with his uh, knowledge of evaluation. He's also very much involved in national government budgeting. So practical experience in the field. So we uh, see experience coming from uh, uh, a government official. Then we have also honorable, uh, M. Tilakaraja. He's a former member of parliament in Sri Lanka. Uh, he's also the treasurer of the Sri Lanka Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation. Uh, and he has been instrumental as a member of parliament and even now as a former member of parliament in doing many things for strengthening evaluation. He was instrumental in creating the parliamentary standing committee on evaluation in the Sri Lankan parliament, and he was also instrumental in drafting of the National Evaluation Bill in Sri Lanka and getting it presented in uh, through cabinet, passing it through cabinet. So he's been playing a huge role and he's part of the, he was part of the organizing committee for the UL 2018 uh, conference, which is one of the, uh, the first conference organized by the Global Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation. And then last not least, we have uh, Josephine Vatera, who is uh, 
head of monitoring and evaluation. Uh, uh, she heads the monitoring and evaluation division in the parliament of Uganda, which means that, you know, Uganda has done a first, has a monitoring and evaluation division and, uh, had, and being the head of it, she works with the parliamentarians. So she has 14 years uh, of working experience in parliament, which is a huge uh, time. And she's been working in performance management, monitoring and evaluation, and, and evidence-based systems. She's also been mentoring the young and emerging evaluators under the UL Youth uh, Program. She's also a board member of IDEAS and many other uh, institutions. And she has hands-on experience working inside parliament and heading the monitoring and evaluation divisions, knowing the demands that come within parliament the capacities, the issues that you have of how to use evaluation uh, in parliament. So when you look at these, uh, the panel who's going to be uh, uh, discussing the issues today, I think there's so much to take home after this session. This is an opportunity that we should use to our maximum. And I would ask all the participants to ask the panel the questions that are relevant at the end of the time. I would uh, like to tell the panelists that you have limited uh, uh, time. We would have three minutes per speaker for each panelist. Please uh, be uh, kind enough to stick to that time. Please keep checking your time. And if, if you're overshooting uh, the time too much, I will have to uh, uh, intervene and put, uh, remind you about the time gaps. So that's part of my job. And uh, uh, I hope we can get the show around. And if all of you are ready, I would like to uh, start with uh, the, the first question. Uh, what are the major challenges parliaments, parliamentarians and parliaments face to increase the use of evaluation for national decision making. So that's one part of the question. Then the second part is how parliamentarians have contributed to promote national evaluation policies and systems by overcoming the challenges. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the first two questions that you have to address. And I would like to start off the session uh, now in that order. Uh, with the panel. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so we would ask uh, the Honorable Natalia Nikitenko to uh, start off the discussion, uh, talk show right now with the first round. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Honorable Kabir Hashim, Honorable participants, I'm very glad to participate in that uh, very important discussion because so many interesting information was in the presentation of Natalia about history, how parliaments get to be more involved in the evaluation agenda. And uh, I would like to show maybe uh, this site from Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, and the countries like ours, emerging democracies, um, independent countries with pretty tough economical situation uh, where evaluation and evidence-based approach is very important for the government, for the parliament, and first of all, for the people. And the question is, uh, what are the major challenges for parliamentarians and parliaments uh, regarding evaluation and national decision-making? So I would say that, uh, Eventually, evaluation uh, is more about governments, evaluators, and in our countries, for example, with um, pretty problematic economies and the huge rate of donor involvement in the budget formation. This is about international partners and donors who have very good uh, strategies on evaluation, implementation, and use. But how parliaments are involved, I would say that unfortunately in many parliaments, they are not very much informed and not very much involved. Although, as Honorable Kibir Hashim mentioned, and I fully agree with that, parliaments, they're key institutions which have 
um, the rights and power to set up the legislation, to discuss the policies, to form infrastructure for use of evaluation, to distribute the budget. Parliaments have oversight function. And all those functions, they are definitely very much important to frame the evaluation culture. But um, the process, how the parliaments are involved and can be involved in not so easy. Uh, regarding the challenges, uh, I would like to underline maybe several areas I would like to say regarding the evaluation challenges in terms of parliament's involvement. First of all, if it is infrastructure. Uh, it's lack of understanding of the role and impact of evaluation among parliamentarians and parliaments, because definitely parliamentarians, they have different backgrounds, professional backgrounds, and not necessarily they know about evaluation, not necessarily they are involved in evaluation. So uh, it's really rare when parliamentarians have the practical experience working with evaluation. Lack of information and infrastructure inside the parliaments. So not all the parliaments, they have units or departments which work with evaluation and can be a useful tool for parliamentarians by request, by demand. Uh, lack of uh, national evaluation policies and procedures inside the parliaments, how practically to implement and use evaluation, uh, especially regarding legislation or national programs and strategies. And definitely lack of communication with evaluators. Um, not in many countries, uh, VOPES, Professional Association of Evaluators, are very much linked and work uh, on the regular basis with members of parliaments and parliaments as institutions. Another thing, this is environmental challenges. Poor links with different stakeholders regarding evaluation and involvement of stakeholders like civil activists, NGO, business association, mass media, in demanding evidence-based results from members of parliaments and parliaments. So if the society is more active, requesting, demanding evidence-based approach and some results, so the demand and, uh, for evaluation is rising and parliaments are getting more involved, responding to the people's needs, to their voters' needs initially. But there is not so serious uh, involvement generally of stakeholders and parliaments in that agenda in many countries. And I would like to mention uh, another dimension like political level. I, I can tell about like my country, Kyrgyzstan. Sometimes it's a low interest of government to use evaluation by the parliament because they perceive that as a tool of control and punishment. Our parliament used to have by previous constitution before the last revolution that we had last year, it used to have serious power over the government and evaluation could be perceived as the control and punishment instrument rather than uh, decision-making instrument and the relevant tool to make the parliaments and governments more efficient. And uh, growing interest from the opposition parties to evaluation also is one of the dimensions that should be taken. So uh, definitely there are different like challenges, but at the same time, Practically, Natalia, we, I, I must mm -hmm. in, interrupt. The time is coming up. You need to uh, finish. So, yeah. Okay. So there are many opportunities as well, and I think that later in the discussion we can share our good practical examples how we try to overcome those challenges on different levels and develop legislation, infrastructure, necessary procedures, and involvement of different stakeholders in the dialogue about evaluation, promoting evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Natalia, uh, for a very comprehensive uh, uh, round there. We thank you very much. And we'd like to go now to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Romulo A.M. Miral, who's uh, the Director General of Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department in the House of Rep Representatives in the Philippines. Uh, he is a person uh, holding over 30 years of experience uh, in uh, working with government and uh, has been especially uh, involved with public expenditure management, budgeting, uh, with national budgeting, with tax reforms, uh, has a wealth of experience and also been working with the evaluation 
policy program in the Philippines. And I think uh, he's the best person for us to tell us how he, they've been able to manage. So the floor is yours, Dr. Romulo. Thank you, Honorable Hashim. And I, my heartfelt uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for this opportunity to participate in this conference. Uh, first, uh, regarding the challenges of parliamentarians that uh, face on the use of evaluation in, uh, in national decision making. As we know, parliamentarians or elected government officials have to respond to various concerns and needs of their constituents. They are elected for a fixed term or period. In the Philippines, congressmen and all local government officials are elected for a three-year period. To be re-elected and stay in office, they have to be perceived by their constituents or electorate to be doing something about their problems. They have to act swiftly, enact policies, institute programs and projects to answer the needs of their constituents. When our legislators value the importance of evidence and evidence-based policy making, the problem is that the evidences they need when making decisions and formulating policies are not readily available to them. Thus, many policies and programs are, form are formulated based on laudable goals and intentions, but not on solid and objective evidence. However, as we all know, good intentions are not enough. As my mother would always admonish me, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. As the problems of society increase and get more complex, while the fiscal space of the government gets narrower due to the pandemic, our legislators have increasingly appreciated the importance of evaluation and evidence-based decision-making. More and more of our legislators are attending our knowledge uh, sharing forums where we feature the results of evaluation studies on some programs and policies of the government, although these evaluation studies are still very few. There is also increasing interest and support for the passage of a law establishing a national evaluation policy. At present, there are three bills in the House of Representatives and two bills in the Senate proposing for the institutionalization of a national evaluation policy. Committee hearings on the bills have been conducted, and there has been wide support among the various government agencies consulted on the matter. The bills contain the following features that can strengthen the evaluation capacity and promote the development of, of an evaluation culture. First, it declares as a state policy the regular and the regular conduct of and use of evaluation to ensure relevance, efficiency, effectiveness, sustainability, and inclusiveness of government intervention. It also establishes the guiding principles and standards for the conduct of evaluation and use of evaluation result. It establishes a national evaluation council consisting of representatives from the different branches of government to oversee the implementation of the national evaluation policy. And it mandates the formulation of a national evaluation strategy in line with the Philippine Development Plan and Costed Evaluation Agenda costing of specific, consisting of specific evaluations to be carried out. And it creates independent evaluation units in the different agencies of the government that shall coordinate the formulation of costed evaluation agenda, manage or conduct evaluations, Dr. disseminate Romero, findings. Uh, I, I hate to interrupt, the time is up. Yes, thank you. And monitor management response to evaluation findings and recommendation. In the questions and answer forum uh, uh, section, maybe I can uh, elaborate more on uh, this, uh, uh, the contents of the evaluation policy and, the, and its status. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, it's a tough job for me to interrupt when such, such valuable information is being given, but we have a time constraint, so I will 
do the hard job part of the job as uh, the chair of the session. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, I'm sure in the question and answer session, we can go more into detail. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, uh, my colleague, Honorable uh, M. Tilakaraja, who has been a former member of parliament in Sri Lanka, who's also the current treasurer of the Sri Lanka Parliamentarians Forum for Evaluation. Uh, the important thing was that he was instrumental in creating the Parliamentary Select Committee in, in the uh, Sri Lankan Parliament. And the Parliamentary Select Committee was involved in drafting the National Evaluation Policy. And uh, Honorable Tilakaraja was part of that team in drafting that National Evaluation Policy, which uh, paved the way for the, the Evaluation Policy to be taken up to Cabinet of Ministers and it got approved. And now it's presented in Parliament as a draft. Bill. He's also been very much involved in talking about uh, setting up a permanent standing committee within parliament, which should be able to work directly uh, in monitoring and evaluation, like what uh, Josephine Vatara will tell us how it happens in uh, Uganda. So I would uh, now like to uh, hand over the floor to Honorable M. Tilakraja. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Kabir Ashim, and uh, welcome you all, I am welcoming you all, my friends and colleagues and uh, participants. Yeah, this is a very good uh, opportunity to me to answer those questions raised by our chairman and uh, enlighten about the challenges and the opportunities which Parliament gives for the evaluation culture. First of all, just I just try to explain then which which background that we have to read these questions to answer. Yes, I divided into two. Those the countries we, we have identified developing country and developed country. In this context of uh, evaluation, that's depend on where we are going to take up this issue, whether it's in developed country or in developing country, in which parliament that we are going to pick up. So in my point of view, Sri Lanka as a developing country and our neighboring countries, women in countries are developing countries in this context with the Sri Lankan experience. I am seeing this matter like, you know, what is the challenge that we have in the developing country that to, to, keep, uh, to take up these evaluation matters? You know, as the understanding of the general public or in the political, uh, the political scenario, the, the lawmakers as a parliamentarians, they are lawmakers, but they have identified or oh, they have recognized or oh, they have to role, play a role that to be a development agent as well. So that everybody thinking that the parliamentarian will do developing works. So this is a very close contact with the evaluation. Once you take the evaluation, evaluation is to guide the evaluator, development projects. So there's a challenge how the development agent to accept the evaluation policies or practice to get implementation. So that is the biggest challenge. So that in the, in the challenge in case, how to take, take decision, whether this development, they are eager to show their development part to the general public and the, their waters especially, uh, their waters that I am the one taking this uh, development. So once that evaluation comes in, so that we have to evaluate whether it is need or not. So that is the biggest challenge that we are starting our work, development works from the estimation now within the financial constraints, so financial availability, what is the donor, uh, donor agencies uh, guiding us how to take the development. So these are according, according to these challenges only, we are involved in this development matters. This is the biggest challenge. So what is the next part? My second part of the question is how that parliament can contribute or how they are contributing. So here the one role of the parliamentarians is very much needed to understand those things. We must do the development work as well as we have to understand whether we are going to start with the financial aspect, with the estimation or the evaluation, whether it is needed. The development is needed one. So how we are going to implement with the get the right impact on the community or the general public. So in that case, parliament must involve, get, uh, get to know about the evaluation, use of evaluation, how we can get right decision on the right time with the original data, with the correct data, with the need of the people of the country, uh, with, with the right impact in the in, in, in forecast in the future, how it's going to be. So evaluation, the theory and practice 
gives us the right path to take the development that we have to get the support of academia and the uh, uh, volunteer organization and the practitioner specialist actually in sri lankan context we are in a path where under the guidance of the uh, honorable kabir azim and the anand kumar uh, anand kumar siri the chair of the sri lankan parliamentarian forum we as the team we are in a path we succeeded to have the uh, policy uh, national evaluation policy and we have the draft bill and also be proposed to have the uh, standing committee in the parliament and we have we are trying to uh, enhance our research parliament research right. team to get involved in that so this is the way, this is the opportunity that we got thank you very much for the time thank you tama thank you thank you uh, thank you honorable tilakaraja for uh, enlightening us about the situation not only in the sri lankan parliament but overall what the position should be um, uh, last but not least i would like to uh, uh invite uh, Josephine Vatera who has been the head of the monitoring and evaluation division of the parliament of Uganda uh, holding over 14 years of experience uh, in the area uh, and she's among the many areas that she works in she works in performance management monitoring and evaluation evidence based systems and uh, she's also a member of ideas and various other both she holds positions and uh, she uh, will be able to tell us how first hand how it's working in the Ugandan parliament and her experience uh, josephine uh, over to you please thank you so much uh, chair and uh, i welcome the members uh, on board for this discussion um, i just wanted to focus uh, this question says uh, the key challenges Uh, a lot has already been mentioned by the members from their far side of experience uh, but i wanted to look more on three areas issues of capacity opportunity and motivation just those three broad areas that we still have committees of parliament that don't have uh, the necessary uh, team of researchers and technical staff to support them the number of parliaments that are still, are still sharing uh, the little resources that are required in terms even of funding and so evaluation doesn't have a uh, good budget lines uh, for funding uh, and and then the issues of capacity in terms of even the undertaking of the of, of the evaluation uh, studies and research and not just utilization of evaluation of evaluation findings as the members observe that members of parliament have a variety of experience and backgrounds where they come from and so sometimes the knowledge of how to actually use this information when it is on the table is is a, is a bit limited and so this is a bit a challenge that we are still facing um also as a parliament and then on the side of opportunity uh there are issues of timing we have learned on the side of Uganda parliament that we have a parliament calendar that that stipulates when we are discussing issues of legislation when we are handling budgeting and when we are handling issues of oversight but many times people miss these opportunities when they are supposed to bring this information members of parliament use for example during the budgeting period then the information is not readily available for them so this missed op opportunities of bringing in evidence to influence decision making by members of parliament has still been a challenge but we are closing in these gaps by engaging uh, the members of civil society the academia for them to know when which information is necessary on the side of parliament on the first challenge on issues of capacity we have the institute of parliamentary studies within parliament uh, that helps to build capacity of both staff and members and we also have the 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 monitoring and evaluation money that has been developed we work together with other centers to also build capacity of mps and staff but also ensuring that we have funding so we have the research department that has a budget line to go and undertake primary evaluations uh, on specific policies and programs of government purposes of informing the oversight function of parliament the last one is the issues of motivation so motivation comes from different angles one is that we have conflicting interests parliament is of course a highly political and hyped place and so conflicting interest in that sometimes there's good evaluation on the table something that looks like good evidence but because the political party will want to come and override uh, the good will that the evaluation is presenting members of parliament sometimes find it hard to actually use this information because then they they may be whipped so we have these challenges of political side that causes a demotivation uh, for purposes of using of evidence but also the issues of power relations like the members observe that sometimes we don't want to see a strong parliament 
So the executive will ignore even good evaluation that have come from parliament and good information for purposes of not wanting to see like they have lost on something on the floor of the house. So the whole aspect of motivation is being addressed from our side. We have the office of the of government of the of government business, but also the office of the opposition that is empowered with policy analysts. They are given a, a budget line to support primarily also data collection and counter pr proposing alt uh, alternative policies to government so that we have an, an, the other side of side B or the two side of the coin, all, all of them on the table for purposes of discussing and the advancing uh, evidence use and evaluation in the parliament. You so can go to somewhere here, Baba, here some, this is there, you just check here somewhere. Can you please mute, please, whoever is speaking. Okay, please go ahead, yeah. I finished here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josephine. Uh, that was a very fine uh, uh, thing. I know the time is very short and you have to speed up, at, but you, uh, you did best use of the time. Thank you, Josephine. Appreciate it. I think that first round uh, gave us such interesting insights uh, into the challenges posed for parliaments. Uh, to actually be able to use evaluation to the optimum. So these, these are the questions that everybody uh, has in their minds. What are the systems that the parliament is adopting to go ahead? So the second question that uh, the second round uh, of the talk show, round two, uh, comes up with the question, how can parliamentarians and parliaments play a role in creating the demand for country-led evaluations for evidence-based SDGs reporting. So uh, this is a very key question. So I will not take uh, time. I'll start off uh, immediately in asking uh, our uh, panelists to get onto the question. Please, because we are overshooting the time already, I would like everybody to stick to their time of three minutes per uh, for each uh, panelist. So I would like to invite uh, Natalia uh, Nikitenko uh, to take on the first round uh, and to start off the second round of questions, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So my honorable colleagues uh, underlined the challenges, but what to do with those challenges? I think we already have pretty good experiences uh, for these past years when the Global Parliamentarian Forum was established. So many positive uh, things happened in many parliaments among the globe. I will just uh, give the example of my parliament of the Kyrgyz Republic, where I worked for 11 years as member of parliament. And uh, actually all over the world now demand from the people on the evidence-based uh, decisions. And uh, actually the impact and results on sharing scarce resources by national governments and parliaments is growing. So the natural demands, those political transitional processes and tensions all over the world, they say that demand for evaluation as the professional tool for evidence-based uh, results is really increasing, but how to work with this growing demand through the parliaments, uh, with the parliaments, Actually, first of all, it's important that there should be leadership in the parliament, awareness of evaluation, importance and potential and leadership. Everything starts with people. In our parliament, there were a few members of parliaments who used to work with national evaluation network, who knew the context of evaluation. And uh, among those members of parliaments, I, would, I work with National Evaluation Network. So this is how we started to discuss how to implement the evaluation procedures on the political level in the national evaluation policies. We started with the development of legislation. In 2014, in Kyrgyzstan, we developed a special law on monitoring and evaluation that set up some framework that evaluation is the compulsory, is mandatory for parliament and government and different agencies on local level. But uh, definitely it's not enough. It should be fulfilled with capacity, with people, with procedures. And it took more than 10 years already uh, to develop those capacities and build those capacities to make the law working. And still there is a lot of work ahead of us, honestly speaking. But anyway, for those... Uh, almost 10 years, there were huge work done 
working together on the regional level, on the global level, through the Global Parliamentarian Forum, exchanging experience with other parliaments. And uh, by today, we come up in Kyrgyzstan with uh, procedures and guidelines for the parliament, how to evaluate legislation and uh, how to evaluate uh, state and national programs through the oversight function of the parliamentarian committees. There are different models among the different parliaments. Sometimes there is a special committees uh, that work specifically on evaluation. But we used another model. We developed and uh, we had a special act, the law on the parliamentary level, uh, regarding the procedures that are necessary for all parliamentarian committees, which have oversight function. So we developed together with uh, Evaluation Network, together with our international partners, Global Parliamentarian Forum, those procedures that really helped our parliamentarian committees have the plan what to do. And it's related with the parliamentarian budget. So nowadays, each parliamentarian committee uh, is um, actually should select at least one national program and one legislation per year and organize evaluation with the evidence, with the results and present the evaluation report on the committee level and on the chamber. And I think this is the uh, really serious step ahead. And uh, we already have pretty good results using implementing this strategy and guide guidelines on the example of several committees after the evaluation that was done, the legislation, amendments of legislation were drafted. And that was uh, widely discussed Dalia, on the political I level. But the time is catching up, please. Thank you. So we have a very interesting example and would like to share with those parliaments and colleagues who are interested. So there are so many different opportunities, but everything starts with awareness, motivation, and leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, I think uh, we'll move on to Dr. Romulo uh, Miral uh, to uh, tell us about the question, uh, second question, please, round two. Thank you. I think you're muted, sir. Yes, thank you, Honorable Hashim. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, evaluation is germane to the three major functions of parliaments, namely lawmaking, oversight, and representation. In the Philippine Congress, the various committee are tasked to study, deliberate on, and act upon all measures referred to them. Measures that in the committee's judgment advance the interest and promote the welfare of the people are then recommended for plenary approval and enactment into law. The various committees of the Philippine Congress have also oversight responsibilities to determine whether or not laws and programs within their jurisdictions are being implemented and carried out in accordance with the intent of Congress and whether or not they should be continued, curtailed, or eliminated. Thus, parliamentarians and parliaments have a natural demand for evaluation and can play as a role in creating the demand for country-led evaluations for evidence-based SDG reporting. Indeed, both houses of Philippine Congress have created the respective committees to oversee the country's progress in achieving its commitment to the SDGs. As pointed out by Senator Caetano, who chairs the Senate Committee on SDGs, the biggest contribution of the committee would be on tackling overlapping goals as many times the other standing committees are left within the confines of its sectoral jurisdiction. The Committee on SDGs will have secondary referral of all bills and resolutions filed. filed. Uh, indeed, uh, both, uh, let me also point out that the Philippine government, mainly through the National Economic and Development Authority, that is in charge of coordinating and overseeing the implementation of the SDGs has participated in two voluntary national reporting exercises in 2016 and 2019, wherein it present to the United Nations High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, the country's progress and lessons towards achieving the SDGs. I think the BNR is a very useful exercise. 
Aside from serving as a vehicle for sharing of experiences and lessons among participating countries, the BNR is also an, an instrument to strengthen policies and institutions of government and mobilize multi-stakeholder support and partnership for the implementation of SDG in the country. More than a commitment to the international community or to the UN, the SDG is an endeavor or a commitment of the government to its people. Congress consisting of elected representatives of the people should be able to hold the government to account for the achievement of the SDGs. Hence, Congress should be at the forefront of the BNRs. Uh, probably I can elaborate uh, more on this uh, in the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Romero. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, I will uh, now like to invite Honorable Tilak Raja to address uh, the uh, participants. Yes. Sure. Yeah, thank you again for the opportunity. Yes, in this case that in the parliament that we have the committee on SDGs as well as we have the committee on evaluation. So that we have to sync both the committees how that we are going to take up these SDGs in the in the in practice in, in the country with the concept of evaluations. So that we must have the clear understanding of that. that. That is very first point that I have to make it out. And also that you know, uh, creating policies or bringing the SDG concepts from the international arena, not, not only working out without practice, that we have to practice those things in the local level. Local level, once we are uh, taking the development activities in the ground, that we have to think about that from the policymakers to implementers uh, from, from the down to the down and uh, we have to get the support from the international organization and the neighboring country that is very important we are such a api conference and all supporting us to share the experiences of the other countries how they are working on actually once i was visiting to pakistan to have to participate in the standing committee on the uh, sdgs in the regional level uh, that I, I, we got some experience from the pakistan uh, Indonesia and the, the other neighboring country and uh, several uh, conferences that we had uh, with other uh, neighboring countries to get the experience. So that kind of practice is very needed. And also the academias the we are, who are learning this process and uh, they can enhance us to get practice on that. And that also that uh, independent, uh, independent evaluators and the volunteer experts in this field, how that we can get the support. As a Sri Lanka parliamentarian forum, treasurer of the Sri Lanka parliamentarian forum, I would like to say that we were trying to get the localized these activities to the ground with the local practice, which is the, the, the national evaluation week, like uh, to have a run in the country to get some example evaluation projects at the ground to get the practice. So this this culture will take taken us taking will take us. Uh, to get practice, what is evaluation, what is the SDG, how that we are going to uh, achieve that uh, uh, SDG goals in the ground with the concept of evaluation. So this is the opportunity, this is a practice that we can carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Thilak Raj. Uh, and uh, I would like to now invite uh, uh, Josephine Vatera for uh, uh, us to listen to her point of view before we move on to the, taking the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. And uh, our last question on how uh, parliaments can create demand. Uh, I will say first legislating for and with evaluation. And the legislating for um, ensuring that we have the necessary policies at the national level and, uh, and, and, and the legislation that covers up what is required under evaluation. And we congratulate, of course, these countries that already have uh, acts that uh, are pro making provisions for use of evaluation. And they, they would legislating with evaluation for Uganda, for example, any bill that is introduced in parliament must be accompanied by an evaluation to show that uh, there was an informed background and, uh, and, and, the, and the evidence on why we need to have this bill uh, enacted. The other one, of course, is budgeting, allocating necessary resources towards evaluation functions so that we have both financial and human resources for evaluation uh, to be used at country level to advance also uh, SDGs. In the area of oversight, like for example, in Uganda, the VNR had to be brought to parliament, the voluntary review report before being taken to, to the high level political forum for, for tabling, but also we use evaluation very much in designing, uh, informing what uh, is uh, designing of programs and policies 
but also in holding the executive accountable for the utilization of resources. So annual reports are required from agencies and, uh, and, and uh, this is in a way to use and follow through how uh, the executive has been performing through the year. I think it's also important that parliaments build networks and important collaborations. We have parliaments that have, for example, in Uganda, the UPNOD, the Africa Parliamentary uh, Network on Development Evaluation, but we need to also open this up to many other parliaments so that we have a network that brings members together for them to better, to, to better be advocates for evaluation. Parliaments also need to open up to work with the civil societies and open up also for citizens to have a platform to bring in uh, evidence and evaluation uh, reports for purposes of views and informing uh, in decisions uh, within parliament. In Uganda, we have what we call uh, the GAPA, the Government Annual Performance Report. It's a whole of government uh, approach where annually the, the agencies and ministries are required to report against the indicators that were developed at the beginning of the year. And part of the conclusion of this GAPA report is a high level uh, meeting for the cabinet where members of parliament are also represented through their ministers to discuss performance of each agency and entity every year. And this informs how the budgeting of the next financial year is going to be done according to what the sectors have reported on. So it's a practice that we need to embrace and uh, use as much as possible evidence for changing the advancing uh, SDGs. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, uh, Josephine. Thank you very much. I think uh, we can now uh, move into the question and answer session right away because uh, we could then manage our times because we have uh, around uh, 20 minutes of which uh, there are many questions that have come out on the chat. Uh, so we could start off with some of those questions and anybody else who wants to ask questions directly can, if you can raise your hand, uh, then that would help us uh, to identify those. But to save time, I would like to uh, uh, move with some of the questions on the chat session. And I would ask, uh, uh, any of our panelists uh, uh, who may be ready to answer it to uh, uh, then uh, please take the question or it can be one or one or more than one person who can answer the question. So there was, uh, this is a question from uh, Mausumi Panda who asks, uh, is there anyone who is familiar with evaluation of legislations and policies by parliamentarians? You know, in, in short, he wants to know whether there's uh, uh, the parliamentary policy, the country policies and legislations that are brought, whether there's any evaluation of those policy evaluations uh, and whether he would, he would like to know if there is any such thing. Would anybody be able to answer amongst the panelists? Honorable Kabir Hashim, if you don't yeah. mind, Natalia yes, uh, no, from yes. Kyrgyzstan. In the previous... Uh, uh, session I mentioned that we have in our parliament special procedure evaluation of legislation and I will be more than happy to share it is translated uh, in English language and uh, I think it will be interesting this is the first uh, let's say uh, first try that we did on the base of our parliamentarian committees and uh, actually the whole procedure is very detailed in those guidelines, how to organize on the level of parliamentary committee evaluation procedure, who is involved. Uh, in our case, this is like the parliamentary committee by its act organizes the working group on evaluation involving evaluators, government officials, different stakeholders, members of parliament and staff of the parliament, evaluation unit staff and committee staff. And uh, definitely there is the usual like procedure for evaluation with criteria, et cetera. Then the um, uh, evaluation group presents the evaluation report on the committee level. And if this legislation is very important for the country, it's not just sectoral, but it covers several sectors, budget issues, et cetera, it's presented on the chamber. We have good example of two pieces of legislation that we reviewed on the committee levels. And we had the new draft of law based on that evaluation results. One is regarding uh, law enforcement against uh, violate, uh, violence against women, bright kidnapping, etc., domestic violence. And another law is related with social issues and uh, social aids to the uh, special categories of people. So we'll be more than happy to share. We have this small experience, but we worked uh, with that within two years. 
Thank you. That was very enlightening and it directly addresses the question that was posed. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to uh, uh, speak about it or we can move on to the... Yeah, uh, Honorable President, yeah. I'm telegraphing this time. I have a quick answer for that. That very good question. Actually, that not only the development projects, but also policies at all should be evaluate, evaluated. In Sri Lankan context, uh, they're directly not with the policies, but in the uh, oversight committees, we had some experience, just we, uh, we scrutinized the uh, post-legislative, uh, uh, the uh, pre-legislative and post-legislative scrutiny work on the act, what we are having in Sri Lanka. But uh, I, I not, I'm not know that much uh, idea that what is the practice in, current practice in the, uh, the oversight committees in Sri Lankan parliament. But we had a part of that before presenting the uh, draft bill to the parliament that will come to the committee. Then we will evaluate that whether it is impact on that, how much that impact that we can, we had written back to the committees which prepared the law, uh, the act draft bill to amend that and also this kind of scrutiny work that we have done. But what you suggest in the question is very, very important one. We have to take up this issue to get in the national evaluation policies that Policies and that act also should be evaluated to time to time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable uh, Tilakaraj. Uh, I think that gives a good perspective of not only uh, uh, programs and projects, but policy evaluation, which is essential because that eventually determines uh, the direction in which a country moves. So uh, we're moving on to the second question, which comes from uh, V. Murali Das, who's uh, uh, in the research division in Parliament of Sri Lanka. And the question is asking is, what is the role of the parliamentary research division to implement the evidence-based policy-making processes, evidence-based legislation processes in the parliament? So what, in short, what is the role of the parliamentary research division in implementing evidence-based policy-making processes? Um, Honorable Tilakraj, would you like to take the question? Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Murali, for raising the question. As uh, all we worked in the parliament, we get the experience that I would like to share, say that how that our research team was before the, we get in into the uh, merge that not only the research department, but also that should be act as the uh, 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 research team of the evaluation in the, in the parliament, that we had some practices as a Sri Lankan parliamentarian forum that we just try to get merged that that's not easy work because already that we have the uh, you know terms and references what is the role of the research uh, unit of the parliament that is in practice that in addition to that what we are trying to say is not not only the research part that they have to do they have to involve in the evaluation practices and get involved in the uh, uh, get involved in the inside the parliament to take up these evaluation matters also. So as a volunteer organization, just we brought the uh, expert uh, academias and uh, experts uh, from outside to be run a, a training program for the research unit, that there should be amendment to be done in the standing committee and the parliament acted laws that not only the research, the, the, not only the, jo the job is not only the research by the uh, unit, but also they should take uh, and uh, and uh, take over that uh, evaluation part also inside the parliament as a practice that we did and also we support to get train the research officers from the department we send them to IBDET also that we took part as a volunteer forum so the Sri Lankan parliament and also the other countries also they get involved they must understand that the role of the research team in the parliament they should be a partner main partner in this juncture to get the right data, right analysis, right information to be given by the research team to the parliamentarians to take right decision on right time. So that is very good question that you asked, but we have to work hard to get on board the research team to the evaluation part. Thank you very much. Okay, any of the other panelists would like to comment on this? So uh, we can- As I pointed- Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Honorable Hashim. Yeah, as I pointed out earlier, um, evaluation uh, provides the evidences that are needed by, the, by legislators. Unfortunately, uh, the evidences required uh, in, in policy in the, when they pass laws or um, when they uh, review the budget 
sometimes the evidences that they need are not readily available. Um, although we, we try to link uh, with um, um, other research institutes if we, uh, and uh, the civil society organizations, the other think tanks, in order to provide the, the relevant information. But uh, many of the information uh, does, do not uh, squarely address really the evidence that are needed by the legislators. And in, in this regard, that I think that evaluation that uh, focuses on certain policies and programs, which really squarely answers the needs of the, the legislators when they look into the programs, when they look into the policies, are the kind of research that are needed, which are sometimes not produced. Because when we review, like for example, like um, the, the literature, Many of these are actually uh, like uh, uh, couched in like academic language that we need to reprocess re re and somehow uh, 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 prepare it in a context that would be really understandable and uh, uh, relevant to the information needs of our legislators. So in this regard, I think uh, really an evaluation, uh, uh, a policy, a national evaluation policy or a system should be in place to really meet the needs or the requirements of the legislators for the evidence that they need uh, in a policy and a program decision making. Thank you. So, the word on the issue of researchers? Yeah. So, Josephine? Josephine? Yes, just uh, uh, one, one, one top addition yeah. on the issue of researchers. So, what we yeah. do in the Parliament of Uganda? The researchers have uh, uh, a proper uh, highlight of what they're supposed to be doing in terms of functions. And one of the main thing we are proud of is the post-legislative scrutiny of, of, of legislation that has been passed. So we take a post-legislative scrutiny after five years to see to what level that impact of the legislation has been felt by the community. But also we do evaluation of government programs. Uh, so when, when government comes and reports that they have achieved a certain level uh, on, this, on a certain program, the research department is empowered to go out and conduct interviews with the private prim primary stakeholders and, and target groups for these programs to get their side of the story. And so they help committees to have the other side to be able to debate on the floor of the house against the information that has been provided by the executive. Thank you. Right. So from, from all this, we can see it's a question of how much capacity each research department in parliament has. Most of the research divisions have still not been uh, strengthened in terms of evaluation capacity, you know, so that, that's how now we are pushing for all parliaments to have a research division which is uh, capacitated in terms of having uh, techniques in monitoring and evaluation. So I think that's a good question that came and uh, I hope we can all get to where Uganda is in terms of that area. The, the two, uh, uh, there's another question from Osmi Panda. Uh, he asks two questions. Should there be an independent evaluator or uh, uh, eval uh, in each evaluation department or in each of the government agencies? Uh, and second question is, how do we ensure that there is trust amongst the employees as evaluation can hold them accountable, which they may, uh, might not have had to do before? So uh, in your experience, I think... Uh, especially with uh, doc, uh, Dr. Romulo uh, and Josephine both can address this question, I believe, and the others too. Um, yes, uh, I th that's a very important question, actually. Um, of course, when um, what uh, we need uh, for evidence-based policy making are independent, objective, and non-partial analysis uh, so that uh, we get the, uh, the right policies and uh, right programs uh, implemented. Um, in a political uh, situation, sometimes this is not, uh, uh, not, not easy because uh, we know that uh, like some legislators have their pet programs or pet policies that they want to push. Um, and uh, this is something that um, uh, does, and I think, and this is also the, the advantage of working in parliament, because uh, as, um, uh, as I mentioned by uh, Honorable Natalia, uh, the parliament consists of uh, uh, different uh, politicians from different uh, uh, ideology, uh, with different ideologies, with different advocacies. And uh, it's really a market for ideas. So um, uh, an independent research office like ours have uh, always a market for our research because uh, um, 
again, you have a different uh, um, consumers or uh, uh, users of research with different uh, needs and, uh, and uh, different political inclination. So I think in that, in that regard, uh, it's uh, uh, working in parliament uh, actually also allows you, uh, if, particularly if you have an independent office, uh, research office, to really uh, provide non-partisan and uh, uh, objective uh, uh, evidence and information uh, that, uh, that uh, would help uh, uh, promote evidence-based uh, uh, policy making. Thank okay. you, Chair, for uh, the question. I could also uh, pick it up. Uh, the issue of independence, uh, it can be an internal thing, but when it is independent of the politics, because that's the main uh, concern in evaluation, being independent of the politics. Uh, and our, the, the objective of the research department, for example, in Uganda, is to be impartial, objective, independent, and, and provide timely uh, information. So once we understand that we, 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 we are employed for purposes of supporting the entire institution of parliament, then it saves us from all the troubles of conflict of interest. And so the independence has highly been ensured for the side of staff. We are not supporting any political party. When somebody wants research that is skewed to one side of the story, then they go to either office of the leader of opposition or leader of, leader of, of, of government business where they can get information that is skewed to any angle they want. But for the research department, it's very independent, though it is still an internal unit. So we really don't have to really have a totally independent individual standing outside there. We can still ensure independence within this uh, prevailing systems. Thank you. Yeah, just to add, add to that, there was also uh, at one point in certain countries where they used a reward system for officials, you know, for people who carried out evaluations successfully. Uh, they were uh, given uh, a system of uh, what you call a bonus or some payment through the government. So people began to compete in, in different departments to ensure that evaluation was carried out. There was also a system that can be supported in this question of how, how do you get government officials to support the evaluation process and whether they become accountable and not want to be accountable. So that's one of the things that uh, came up in my mind. Would like to move on to the next uh, yeah, question. Uh, if you're okay with that, as this is from Ms. Ajwadeen in Sri, from Sri Lanka. The question is, how can mainstream monitoring and evaluation principles in parliamentary practices be accommodated by the key evaluation criteria into the years old conventional parliamentary business? It's the, the, the issue with the old system and the old accounting system and how do you bring the monitoring and, monitoring and evaluation principles into that uh, in parliament practice? I think all of you all are capable of answering that question, I think. Uh, yes. yes, sir. I'm Tilak Raja. Can I answer? Short? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ajwadin. He's, he's our colleague. Uh, he was with me in the, that training program as a research officer, joining me as a parliamentarian. So, yeah, uh, that, that's what my, my proposal to the parliament, to have the standing committee inside the parliament. So what we are having in the Sri Lankan parliament at the moment, COPE and COPA, doing part of this. But I'm not criticizing that practice, but that is post-mortem. So after the event, after the any projects and programs that, that happened, that occurred the year before, just we took up uh, that uh, issues in the committee that we are discussing that. That's what I'm just proposed to parliament. That's what our chairman also insisting that I have proposed to the parliament. To have a standing committee on evaluation is get rid of the uh, evaluation concept inside the parliament will be in a high, 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 high uh, in a high level so that will be a good practice what we are saying in the conventional practice what we are having with the dealing with only with the accounting or financial perspective we are going beyond then that we are just trying to get the to all the uh, criteria what we have developed uh, in the international you know, context what we are developed for the uh, for the evaluation that will be uh, taken up inside the parliament so that the parliament committee will take the issues once that project proposal is introduced or proposed by the government that will be taken up before even as a uh, uh, you know uh, the, the pre-evaluation part so exam evaluation that we will take up this issue whether it's needed so in Sri Lankan context all we know what kind of failure projects that we have with a million of dollars invested in that so that COPA and COPA that can uh, evaluate, so uh, uh, then do that post-mortem report on that. But 
all finished. But in the kind of committee, what we are proposing to have in the parliament to enhance, to analyze, to evaluate the impact on what will happen in future. So that kind of practice may support the uh, new culture uh, instead of the conventional practices that we have in the parliament. Thank you, Jordan, for the question. Okay. Uh, so uh, there is a question addressed to Dr. Miral from Noah Navo. Uh, uh, Dr. Miral, this is for you. How will the proposed legislation help to institutionalize the practice of evaluation and the creation of, a, of an evaluation ecosystem in the Philippines? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, uh, the national evaluation policy as uh, contained in the bills that are being uh, that are before the House of Representatives in the Senate uh, in the Philippines. Um, provides for the following features, which I think uh, can uh, promote the development of evaluation capacity and uh, evaluation culture. Uh, first, uh, it declares as a state policy um, for the conduct of regular um, uh, regular conduct and use of evaluation uh, to ensure the effectiveness of uh, government interventions. Uh, it also establishes the guiding principles and standards for the conduct of evaluation and the use of evaluation results. And uh, it establishes a national evaluation council consisting of representatives from the different branches of government to oversee the implementation of a national evaluation policy and, and to ensure that we have an integrated uh, uh, evaluation system as uh, we observe that uh, while, uh, law, while government agencies, uh, different government agencies have uh, their uh, monitoring evaluation units, uh, evaluation are being conducted in silos, and many of these evaluation studies are just uh, within uh, the confines of each government agencies. Uh, next, uh, the, the bill uh, to address these concerns mandates the formulation of a uh, national evaluation strategy uh, in line with the Philippine Development Plan and uh, the preparation of uh, eval an evaluation agenda consisting of specific evaluations to be carried out. And it also provides for the creation of uh, independent evaluation units in the different agencies of the government to coordinate uh, uh, and implement uh, evaluation and uh, to disseminate findings and monitor management response to evaluation findings and recommendation. And uh, finally, it mandates that the funding requirement for the implementation of the national evaluation policy be included in the uh, Annual General Appropriations Act of the government so that there, to ensure that there's really budget for evaluation activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, that comprehensive answer. Um, I think we have a, a question from uh, Mr. R.A. K. D. Ramanayaka. Uh, his uh, question is that my personal belief is that if government needs strong evaluation intervention in their countries, evaluation policy is compulsory. Moreover, national evaluation council or institutions should be formed separate to the parliament or presidential policy. So basically he's talking about asking you all the question about how important is evaluation policy and uh, that it should be made compulsory. Uh, your views on that. Honorable Kabir, yes. can I answer? Yes. Thank you yes. for the question. Definitely, it's ideal model, I would say, that evaluation procedures are compulsory. Everyone shares the evaluation culture and uh, like understands why it is on different level of powers in the parliament, presidential office, and the government and local level. And uh, there is a national evaluation policy and procedures. And I think that we're, you know, smoothly coming to that ideal model, building evaluation ecosystem, evaluation culture. But unfortunately, in many countries, um, it doesn't work like that. It takes time because parliaments are very political institutions and definitely evaluation is the point of political discussions very often, not as a professional tool. But uh, to build a national evaluation policy, it's very important to have really independent evaluation agency. And... Uh, also to institutionalize on the level of legislation and procedures in the parliamentarian level and governmental level 
uh, like the procedures and the culture of evaluation. It takes time. It's all together with trainings for those people who are involved for the units, establishing units in the parliaments and the governments. It's all together a number of different steps. But I share the view that evaluation should be kind of compulsory in our country. In Kyrgyzstan, we tried through the legislation to have the uh, evaluation compulsory for local level and national level. But until there is no infrastructure, no people, units, procedures, understanding, leadership, motivation, it will not work, even if there is a law, framework, whatever. So it's all together. So I think that is kind of the long way, but we're building it together in different countries with different models, building on different levels, evaluation, culture. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Natalia. I don't know whether anybody else would like to respond to that question. Uh, and in our experience, I think uh, uh, Asia Pacific Evaluation Association has been doing uh, mapping, global mapping, and a special mapping of the Asia Pacific region of how many countries have national evaluation policies and what, to what level evaluation has become institutionalized. And the experience is that, yes, national evaluation policy is uh, an important or uh, compulsory constituent of institutionalizing uh, evaluation in a country and mandating through the man ma mandating it, it becomes very strong. But we've also realized that even if you have a national evaluation policy, if you don't have a proper process, a system, then the policy cannot be implemented. So the system becomes as important. And above all that, the important thing is the political leadership that oh, yeah. supports the institutionalization. So it's like everything has to work together. But one of the key components of that is the national evaluation policy. So I think that was a good uh, question that came, I think, for us to discuss. And thank you, Natalia, for that uh, uh, response. Um, anybody else? So can we move to a, another question? And um, this is a general question which is uh, addressed to all panelists by Ajay. Uh, he, what he asks is, what is the process to evaluate system level indicators, particularly related to leadership and governance, and whether such evaluation can be done by third party? Is there anybody who would like to take up this uh, question? Is the question re relating to like an evaluation within parliament? I don't know, but uh, if it's uh, within parliament, I uh, think we, have, so, yes. uh, we have a number of tools. Uh, for example, Uganda domesticated the IPU tool of, 28, of 2008, uh, self-assessing of parliament. And so they assess the, the, the leadership, they assess the committees, they assess the functioning. Uh, of parliament. So we hold this annually and we have members in a kind of workshop setup and they do pick up the indicators. So the indicators are, 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 are stated and they are rated from one to five uh, of each of these uh, functions of parliament. And then we expand it to look at also international uh, representation of parliament. Uh, so this is domesticated within the Uganda parliament and this is done uh, annually. Of course, this we have a short time here to go into so much detail but we can share also the tool uh, with, with whoever uh, needs this. We can share with the secretariat and then you can make, make be available for the members after the, 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 the session. Uh, uh, Josephine, that's, that, that, that was a good uh, answer, but there's another question which is connected and I think uh, which might be uh, 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 your right up the same area and I would like you to respond. Ronald Okai asks a question. Could you highlight examples in which social accountability assessment by evaluation professionals at parliament was conducted with grassroots communities, particularly to determine the quality of their participation in legislative decision making at parliament? Yes, sir. I'm Tilakradia, eager to answer that question. Actually, I, I congratulate okay. <laughs> Dennis also inside the chat. Yes, of course, that's very important. Uh, that in fact that I must say that how that the parliament practices are uh, uh, in, 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 in ongoing world, world uh, you know, in Sri Lankan context, I maybe maybe in the other uh, developing countries also could happen like that. 
actually that uh, the representatives um, elected to the parliament from a party. So there's a practice, openly I must say that, that, that the MP is serving to the party cadres or according to the party cadres or to satisfy their party cadres. That is the criticism that we have to take up in the common flow to discuss. That should not like that. We have to work for the community or the people. So as a parliamentarian, there is no way to come into the parliament to work for the people through a party. But once you come as a parliamentarian, we have to think about the country, a nation, a people, a common development, general development for that. So in practice that we have experience in regarding this as a oversight committee members, as a financial committee, financial committee in the parliament, public finance. We just had an experiment on that. We as a committee, all party members got together, visited to a district, and we hold a, a discussion with that uh, <clears throat> civil societies, with the government officials in the uh, in the ground, especially that I must say the district, that Betiklo district, which is the uh, eastern part of Sri Lanka. We got lots of ideas and the uh, uh, inputs from the general public and the civil societies how that could be. For example, I would like to uh, limit with that example. For, for instance, our, our, our chair was the uh, minister of highways on that time. What we did, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, criticizing that, but in the practice that we are going to, we have to elaborate. We allocate, we say, 20 million to each MPs to put up a carpet road in, the, uh, uh, in their uh, area or district. What happened? Already there are carpet roads in some districts. But in some other district, there are no, no roads, such a developed road, but they no, not enough funds for even 20 million is not enough for them. What we are saying is simply that we are allocating funds to equal funds to all the MPs, where evaluation comes here. That we have to evaluate in which district, what kind of allocation is need for the road, whether it is carpet row, whether it is concrete row, whether it is tar road, or any other form. So what is that? So this kind of practice is not there from the government. But once you are visiting to the CSOs, they are saying that this is the need of the Betiklo one. This is the need of the Nuerele one. This is the need of the Monaragala one. From the civil societies only that we can get that what is the actual need of that people that we have to allocate the funds from the national budget. So what is the, what is the proposal by the Ronaldo is very good. Yes, we have to get the participation of the grassroots level to the tech decision making. The committees, what I propose, they, that committee can play a role, such a things to travel around the country, to travel around the grassroots people, to get the ideas from that. Then we can plan it out that we can submit to the National Budget Committee. This is the one that we have to take up, divide the, divide the regional development concept there according to the resources, according to the availability, according to the need of the people. We have to plan the development works through the evaluation concept. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Yeah, right. Something small on that, on social accountability. I want to give a quick example. We did constitutional amendments in Uganda in 2017. And one of the things that was done was the members of parliament were facilitated to go out and consult with their constituencies on what they feel, uh, what, what they think about the amendments that were being done on the constitution. It was a specific article. And I can tell you that the, some of the members who came back and said yes, when the, 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 the consultations had told them to say no to the amendment, did not make it back to the current parliament. So we have a strong um, responsibility on the side of citizens uh, in terms of social accountability that when they give a voice and that's not the voice that is represented, the public has the mandate and the power through their vote to actually get these members out. So I just wanted to share that example. Okay, I think uh, uh, Dr. Romulo, you have your hand raised, you need to ask uh, you need to respond. <laughs> yeah, I think the quality of uh, people participation would vary depending on the levels of government. Of course, at the local government level, there will be more direct uh, participation. But as we go higher up to the national level, the question of representativeness, uh, are, are, uh, how representative are the uh, people that we are talking to is some, something that needs to be, thought, uh, needs to be considered. And I think in this regard, the institutionalization of like a citizen report card or surveys can really help um, uh, uh, to, to uh, promote uh, this social uh, accountability. Because in that, uh, with that survey, it can be more representative rather than uh, just uh, mere public hearings where there are just uh, selected people uh, that are uh, 
invited to the hearings. Thank you, Dr. Miro. I think uh, uh, our lead presenter, Natalia Koshelvash, I think uh, in fairness, we should, I'm sure you would have some uh, uh, comments to make uh, or answer some of the questions. And I would like to also listen to your comments uh, to uh, look at all these things, the questions that were posed. Can we ask you to respond? Oh, thanks, Kabir. And it was really a great pleasure to listen to this session because it's just so great to hear members of parliament talking about the importance of evaluation. So oh, I think my key reflection is that in a sense, every country finds its own, every parliament finds its own way in learning about evaluation. And I think I really would like to iterate. I think that it's very important for us to get together and exchange experiences because I think this peer to peer learning is most important. And I think probably for members of parliament that are not using evaluation yet, it would be more convincing to just hear from other members of parliament and learn from this experience. And I again really would like just in conclusion, maybe say that uh, the Global Parliamentarian Forum, when it started in 2016, I think, it's just started very humble and it's very encouraging to see how much progress you, you made in those years and just wanted to, to remind the colleagues actually that this year we're celebrating 10 years of VAL partners and I'm understanding that like next year, it will be 10 years of the Global Parliamentarians Forum. So I really hope that this discussion will start the broader discussion internationally, which will other evaluation associations will be able to continue on other platforms. And that actually this discussion will contribute to greater use of evaluation and actually towards better policies, because I think what's really coming from here is that <clears throat> parliament need the evidence and parliament will can improve their evidence-based policy making by the use of evidence, but it also can kind of support the use of evaluation system-wide. So, um, and I really think it's very great that we have uh, able to have this joint conversation between evaluation professional and professional policy makers. And I think it's kind of how it will help to advance the SDGs agenda and make the life of people better among other things. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank I thank the panel and everyone else. It's we, we are way past our time. I hand it over to the organizers now to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Kabir Rashim, for uh, chairing this panel and excellent moderation, and also our panelists, uh, Natalia Kosheleva, Natalia Nikitenko, Josephine, uh, Director General Romilo, and uh, Honorable Tilakaraja for the very fruitful uh, discussion and the panel. Uh, so we will uh, uh, close the session now, but of course, you know, the discussion can be continued. And we also thank our participants and also the production team for the excellent support. Thank you very much and we end here.